Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Duclos, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for Bluefin. I wanted to thank you all for attending today's webinar, Point-to-Point -point Encryption in POI Environments, Scope, Cost, Benefits, and Implementation. Today's presentation will last approximately 45 minutes, and we will allot time at the end for questions. To ask a question, simply type into the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, we are recording the webinar and it will be posted on our website this week. We will send you a link when it has been posted so that you may share it with your colleagues. Today's presenters are Sis Van Usten, Senior Manager, Global Intelligence for Verizon Enterprise Solutions, and Russell Miles, Chief Strategy Officer for Bluefin. Sisk is the lead author of our recent white paper and a well-known speaker on PCI security compliance management and performance improvement. Sisk has addressed 134 conferences and events in 26 countries, and he is a champion of rethinking data protection to cultivate effective data security and control by addressing the key contributors of security breaches. Rustin is the Chief Architect of Bluefin's PCI-validated point-to-point -point encryption solution, which was the first validated solution in North America, introduced in March 2014. Rustin is a key proponent of PCI-validated P2PE and has worked closely with the PCI Security Standards Council on enhancements to the P2PE standards, as well as case studies on Bluefin P2PE clients. Rustin serves as an educator on payment security, is a frequent industry and conference speaker, and has been quoted for pieces in Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, Inc., Payment Source, Dark Reading, and more. And with that, I would like to introduce Sisk, who will open today's webinar with an executive summary on our recent white paper. Thank you, Danelle. Well, today we are excited that you join us to review the new white paper that to be published recently that explore the tremendous value that point-to-point -point encryption can add to protecting data in point of interaction environments. So what do you do when you are the person responsible to come up with a plan in your organizational team to protect sensitive data? And not just any data, payment card data, which for threat actors, hackers, organized criminal groups across the globe, still remains a highly sought after data type that they can easily monetize. So you have your work cut out for you. After you evaluate all the available security frameworks and standards, you realize that it is still a very complex environment that must be simplified if you want to succeed. You need to form a calculated approach and design a data protection program that will offer you the best chance to protect data in a repeatable, consistent, and measurable way. So you need to move from asking, how do I protect data, cart all the data, to how can I reduce or even eliminate the data altogether? So all organizations benefit from reducing the workload needed to maintain hundreds of controls and validate compliance with standards such as PCI DSS, which is why this was such a wonderful opportunity for me to write this white paper and bring these insights into perspective. So I've been in a privileged position to have direct access to the team that produced the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report and to have been in that role every day for the past 10 years. So in addition to that, I research payment card data protection and compromise trends every year as part of my daily work as the lead author of the annual payment security research report. So I've studied the details of data breaches for over a decade, since 2008. And when you review such volumes of data over such a long period, you see clear patterns. You know in detail what works, what does not work, and why. And you know the difference between security breach and the data compromise. What exactly contributes to making them possible? And what will it take to increase control effectiveness and simplify the complexity? So four organizational areas that have the biggest impact in sustainable and effective data protection where organizations lack process maturity are capacity, capability, competence, and commitment. And in this white paper, we explain how validated P2PE can help solve each one of them. So more organizations continue to accept payment card data while their data protection strategy is based on hope that the data will somehow remain protected from point of, of interaction where the card data is accepted until it reaches a database somewhere in their backend internal network. And hope alone is not a strategy. You must plan, prepare, and act. And that is why there's a need to provide perspective on the value of deploying validated P2PE to protect the data from the point of interaction all the way through the, its lifecycle. 
And we know that data protection requires a layered approach. It must be robust and you need several lines of defense. So in this paper, we explain the threat landscape associated with POI attacks. And most attacks include the use of malicious software. Now, while malware is becoming increasingly sophisticated, it is still not capable of extracting any value of data that is securely encrypted at the point of interaction. We also describe an immensely powerful tool set, how the combination of validated P2P E solution fills the gaps between EMV and tokenization to offer true point-to-point -point protection. So what is the problem across the industry today? How many organizations are succeeding and how many are failing their data protection efforts? The thousands of organizations do succeed each day in protecting their data and they fend off attacks every day, some by luck, some by design. The problem is that about half of organizations that validate PCI security compliance annually do not have a sustainable protection program in place and they are at much higher risk of data compromise. So they struggle with resources and they need to find a way to reduce the scope and effort of their environment for data protection to be sustainable. So there are very good reasons why validated P2PE is the preferred solution. It introduces a level of operational simplicity and improvement of effectiveness and sustainability, which is not seen with any other technology. And it can substantially reduce and help you to create the, the capacity that you need, the capability and the competence you need to manage the data protection and your regulatory compliance in a sustainable and highly effective manner. So we cover each of these sus subjects uh, in the paper. And with that, I will hand over to Rustin to take you through the contents of the paper. Rustin? Excellent, thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you, Siski, for, uh, for the introduction and the overview there. I guess we'll take a step back for a second and talk about how big is this problem uh, that, that we're solving, and then we'll get down into some of the findings. Um, <clears throat> a study done uh, a couple years ago uh, that took quite some time, obviously, to put together, uh, sought to see just how big is the estimated annual cost of cybercrime. Uh, and that was uh, globally found to be about $6 trillion. Very interesting report uh, by Dr. Michael McGuire from England's University of Surrey. Um, that, uh, so that's, a, that's about how big it is. And attackers generate for themselves per, uh, about $1.5 trillion in annual profit. So it's costing um, merchants and consumers and, and the industry $6 trillion, um, and, but, it's, but it's netting about $1.5 trillion. So as you can see, the, the, the costs are outweighing the profit uh, because oftentimes post a breach, it costs a lot more to fix uh, the, the compromise uh, that are occurring. To give you some scope there, that's about equivalent to Russia's entire GDP, uh, and it would be the 13th largest uh, GDP in the world. In fact, it would be larger than Spain, larger than Mexico, larger than Australia. So this is a very big uh, and growing um, dark economy here. The total cost to the public and private sectors, as I pointed out, $6 trillion. So this is a problem, a big problem already, and a problem that's getting larger. So how is this problem happening? Um, well, the, we, the, some of the attack vectors, uh, you know, uh, to get in, obviously, uh, CISC pointed out that the, um, that the, uh, that malware, malicious software uh, is the, is the actual, uh, software or the, the, that, that's, that's gleaning the data, but how is it getting there? Well, it's the same old threat actors, right? Weak passwords, SQL injection, man in the middle attacks, spear phishing attacks that are highly directed towards executives or administrators with specialized and privileged access, remote ve attack uh, vectors, um, uh, poor patching, not keeping up with these things. So as you can see, uh, all of these different ways, uh, all of these different paths are being exploited by hackers in any manner possible for them to get in and then to insert their malware, uh, which would then um, be able to, uh, uh, to, to get that data. Uh, Cisco pointed out that threat actors take advantage of organizations that fail to reduce the size of their attack surfaces. These attackers attempt to steal data from POS systems using various methods. Um, and that's important. As you know, some of these organizations may have, uh, you know, of course, their headquarters, but they may have tens of thousands of locations. So their attack uh, surface is very broad from a geographic perspective, and they might be very broad from a technological perspective, too, having uh, card not present environments like contact centers, call centers, mail order, telephone order, um, and uh, other back office processing, as well as traditional point of sale, mobile, uh, e-commerce, all sorts of different ways that folks can get in, attack, uh, you know, uh, one 
unpatched particular network or system, gain access to the network, and then get access to be able to compromise data among many resources, um, you know, company-wide and perhaps worldwide for some of the global multinationals. So hacking still remains the leading attack vector. Um, according to the ITRC Identity Theft Resource Center, uh, the total breaches uh, for 2017, as you can see, was about 1,632. So as you can see, that um, was up sharply over the breaches in 2016. But take a look at 2018. Um, I have heard folks say, well, you know, we must be doing a good job because breaches are down by, uh, you know, nearly 400 breaches uh, in 2018. So all this stuff is working, right? Well, look over to the right there, very important. Um, that records exposed, you know, more than doubled. So this means that the hackers are uh, optimizing, uh, they're getting more bank for their buck, fewer breaches, fewer breaches, um, but uh, more than 100% growth in records exposed and compromised. Um, unauthorized access, accidental exposure, um, you know, employee error, negligence, and proper disposal of data, physical theft, sometimes insider theft. But as you can see, a lot of this has to do with exterior threats and just hacking. Um, including phishing, malware, ransom attacks, being able to get in and get, the, get at the data. So the bad guys have proven effective uh, and, and, uh, and themselves resilient against our defenses uh, in, 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 for this industry, uh, being able to uh, attack and penetrate the defensive depth that many merchants have been able to put forward and really get this data, breach the walls, and then compromise the data. And as uh, Cisco pointed out, uh, we do see a very uh, sharp difference between a breach and a compromise, and it really goes right to the heart of the value proposition for point-to-point -point encryption or for encrypted data, and that is because, um, hey, even if they are able to breach unpatched uh, network or, or, or a patch that has been used poor patching, or if they're able to get around some of the defensive depth that a merchant has, and they're able to breach, quote-unquote, breach the network or breach the defenses, but they can't compromise the data because it's encrypted, then what is, what is the value? And we'll get on into that, but um, as you can see, a lot of these attacks have to do with um, allowing access in to uh, being able to get to expose the data. And so what we're setting up here is to be talking about, well, what happens if they're able to get in uh, and, and breach the defenses? Malware, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. Uh, this is a favorite for point of sale attacks. You know, if you go back uh, sort of 10 years or so, uh, maybe back to the beginning of the PCI Security Standards Council, you know, maybe 20, 2006, 2007 timeframe, you know, a lot of the breaches were the hackers getting past the defensive depth um, and then uh, exposing a database or a log of credit card data that was not encrypted or file storage or whatever it might be offline, they're able to get this data all in one, um, you know, uh, attack and liberate, you know, millions of car data and you hear about this big, huge breach. And to their credit, many merchants and providers have spent quite a bit of time protecting themselves, going through the data security standard, um, the, you know, 300 and some odd requirements and or security controls, if you will and implementing those in, in order to keep the bad guys out. And so what happened there is, is that as the, um, as the industry's caught up and innovated and started to protect itself, that meant that the hackers had to innovate themselves. Them, themselves. Obviously the hackers have to stay either one step ahead of the merchants or they are, are relegated to catching merchants that are one step behind uh, the state of the art security. So uh, they have to live in those two areas in order to uh, be successful at their job, which is to hack. So one of the things they innovated on was to say, look, instead of trying to attack this data where it's most specially protected and, and, and highly protected back at data centers and headquarters, let's get it right out at the edge in all of these thousands of point of sale systems and unprotected perhaps card devices where there's no full-time security staff. It might be a sandwich artist or uh, a, a clerk. Um, where there might be n no one beyond that level of expertise on site, uh, but maybe once or twice a year, or maybe everything else is remote accessed in, um, and they're all franchises. So it's very rare that there's anyone with security knowledge or, 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 or even perhaps basic information technology background or experience. So that is the unprotected edge, and boy, did they go after it, right? Those are the breaches that we've all heard about in the news uh, since about 2013, um, almost every other week or certainly every other month or every month, if you will, um, just the largest names and some of them getting breached more than once. 
And that's because it, uh, while they might be able to do a good job of protecting the back office and the central office, it is, um, it is, it can be virtually impossible to protect tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of locations with thousands of different attack vectors, um, with, you know, hackers literally sending out, um, I think it was, you know, dozens of, of attacks per second, um, you know, so millions and millions of attacks per year looking to expose just that one little hole that might be left open in order to get in and expose the data. So it is certainly a very tragic cat and mouse game, but they have innovated to this. We do have the answer for this, so don't get too scared, please. There are two choices to, 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 to defend the data, uh, or to protect the data, I mean. You can defend the data, and that's what I talked about, and that's the high walls, the firewalls, the defensive depth. That's the philosophy of keep the bad guys out, don't let them uh, you know, cross the moat or scale the wall or go under the wall. And um, that's the one that's largely been, um, in my opinion and the opinion of some others, um, unsuccessful or has led to some of the breaches. If you're only looking at keeping the bad guys out, what happens if they get in, if they breach? Can they compromise the data? The second approach here on the right of the screen is to devalue the data. And that says, hey, even if they're able to breach your defenses and get to the data, um, they can't compromise the data. The data has been devalued. And, and of course, that's the whole point. These hackers don't just want to uh, earn, earn a badge or write a passage here to say that they were able to get in. They want to monetize this data. They want to get this card data. They want to sell it on the dark web for anywhere from $40 to $80 per swipe or for, per card number. Um, or upwards, uh, if they're able to attach that to uh, financial information, uh, personally identifiable information, um, medical records, uh, student records, other things that may be able to help them uh, help a fraudster perfect their identity takeover and identity theft, they might be able to sell this for upwards of 100 or 120, 150, 300 dollars, you know, per record, uh, depending how um, on, on how much data can all be collated. So uh, this stuff is all monetized on the dark web. Um, and so what happens here is if we can devalue that data by encrypting it, by tokenizing it, um, then, you know, whether it's in storage or in transit, then even if the bad guys can get in, they are not able to get to the data. And really what we're seeing is most uh, sophisticated merchants doing both of these things, doing a good job at keeping the bad guys out, using, you know, traditional uh, data security standard security uh, controls, um, because that's good hygiene and good practice. Uh, and, and also good for data that's not even card data, right? So it's a good security posture. But also when it comes to that sensitive data, the sensitive cardholder data, hey, let's go ahead and have it encrypted. Um, CISC points out that enterprises must substantially simplify their control environments and reduce the surface area and complexity for defense. While organizations cannot stop all security breaches, they can prevent or at least mitigate the possibility that the data is compromised. And this, this is all, one of the point I really like is even to the head of the Senate is that they have to simplify their environments. Um, if you've got 335 security controls, you've got thousands of environments uh, that you're trying to, uh, you know, I'd say cardholder data environments, these might be locations all over the world, uh, and you're trying to manage this 365 days a year and you've got a team of 30 folks, you know, some point <laughs> uh, the complexity of that ever moving and dynamic system that you're trying to secure with new patches coming out all the time and new attack attacks coming all the time is 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 something that the complexity is in of itself uh what is um opening exposing the network because it's just unmanageable as just pointed out at the top of our conversation and this defend this devalue the data through encryption approach allows uh these security teams to be able to significantly uh, sometimes up to 90% folks have shown uh, simplify their cardholder data environments, reduce the scope, reduce the applicable uh, controls that might be there in order to better manage and effectively manage their world and better secure it. And then also be able to uh, offer, um, be able to look at how they're going to secure even just business information, corporate information, PII information, so that they're not always spending all of their time you know, playing cat and mouse, trying to keep the bad guys and the hackers away from the credit card data. So this is a significant tool in simplifying the environment so that uh, these security teams can actually effectively do their job and maybe even uh, do, a, do, a, do, a, do a job more, more efficiently. So P2PE or point-to-point -point encryption, this is, this is encryption inside of the device. Uh, you know, this is not to be confused with P2P 
peer-to-peer -peer encry encryption or point-to-point point -to -point, uh, tunneling protocol, which are networking um, sorts of concepts. Point-to-point -point encryption is the PCI Security Standard Council's uh, specific name, what they call uh, their certified validated, um, their standard, if you will, that helps to validate providers of end-to-end -end encryption or what might be more simply uh, understood as device encryption. So this is where uh, uh, millions of keys uh, and with the new adoption of AES stuff, but billions of keys can be injected into each credit card or device. And every time a card is swiped, uh, typed, dipped if it's an EMG, uh, EMV chip uh, or tapped, it is encrypted with a one-time unique encryption key. And it ha happens inside the firmware so that even if there's any uh, tap to the device itself in the application area, but certainly out into the network and out into the operating systems and out into the rest of the, the, the merchant's world, and even on as they pass it to their processors and gateways, it is encrypted. Uh, this uh, thoroughly frustrates the hackers. So this is what we talk about P2P. We mean this device-based, hardware-based encryption that happens right inside the firmware of the card machine. The PCI uh, Security Standards Council created this standard to establish uniform encryption requirements. Yes, there are end-to-end -end encryption systems out there um, you know, that pre-existed this, but without a standard, the merchants and the businesses that are trying to uh, to purchase this and make an, an educated decision have no objective criteria outside of the subjective criteria provided to them by the sales person um, that, uh, you know, what am I looking at? How does it measure up? How does it stack up? What requirements does it meet? What requirements does it not meet? Um, what kind of encryption? What, can it, what reliance can I place on this particular encryption system versus just, uh, you know, vendor claims? And that's why this standard was, was created uh, and published. And again, as Danielle pointed out, Bluefin was the first of North America to, um, to, uh, to become validated under the, um, under the P2PE standard here. Troy Leach, the CTO of the PCI, stated, made, made this great quote that P2PE provides merchants with one of the most significant ways to minimize where crim criminals can attempt to steal the cardholder data by immediately encrypting, that's the important word, immediate encryption, at the earliest point of entry in their store. So this happens right in firmware, right where the ICCR, if it's an EMV chip, or right where the MSR, you know, the little Mac stripe reader head, if it's swiped, or in the keypad, if it's typed, or in the radio, NFC, near field communication radio, if you're tapping the card or tapping the phone, it's encrypted right in the firmware of that little radio before it gets to the rest of the device and before it gets out of the device for sure. So at that earliest point of entry, it's immediately encrypted. This achieves one of the most fundamental security objectives, which is to reduce the attack surface. So you're seeing all points, uh, all, you know, all roads leading to Rome here uh, on uh, this is the way that you're, you're, uh, the industry is looking at devaluing the data and uh, encrypting it, uh, you know, well beyond, um, uh, well before the hackers can get access to it. We think that this is not uh, a technology that should live on its own. And, uh, and oftentimes we do get into debates, um, or I would say folks try to get us into debates with, well, you know, what about EMV? And well, what about tokenization? We do believe that this is a holistic payment security strategy. Um, point to point encryption, obviously, uh, is, since I said it was hardware, means that a piece of hardware has to be present for it to be encrypted. And it's immediately encrypted. And after its life cycle for that authorization of the card is over, you know, it's gone onto your processor. And they provide the approval code back. If you prefer to store that card data for future use, well, that's where tokenization comes in, right? So now your processor or your payment gateway or your token service provider provides that token back to you and you store that. So we see that as protecting data at rest and point-to-point -point encryption or immediate encryption, as Troy Leach called it, protecting the data in motion. Really that data, um, you know, when you first received it. And, and those are the two areas where we see a lot of the compromise. I, 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 EMV is an anti-fraud technology, right? So this is that chip in the card that you all probably have in your wallets now, and certainly by the end of the year, we'll have many more. And um, some, some of the reading I've seen I mean, has shown that there's going to be contactless uh, uh, cards uh, being issued by some of the major banks, even um, you know, going on to the middle and end of this year in the, in the order of millions. So we'll all be able to have that convenience as well. But that's all about making sure that if the bad guys do steal the data, they can't go create another chip. But they can go use that card number online, mail order, telephone order, all, you know, use for contact centers, e-commerce, whatever they want. 
So it really just reduces a little bit of what the bad guys can do if they steal the, um, the data from an EMV chip transaction. So, you know, really we need to look at that technology as not being a security technology, but being an anti-counterfeit technology, stopping the counterfeit of plastic cards. But as we all know, um, not every transaction is, is using the actual physical plastic card. Many are using the, um, the, the card being keyed in. Um, or So the 16-digit card number, the CBV code, the expiration date, these are all still sensitive data elements that need to be encrypted. And certainly point-to-point -point encryption, as you can see as we have it at the top here, should be used no matter what transaction method you're using um, where, where there is a card involved. It should be you know, being used for a swipe, tap, dip, uh, or type, any kind of card. Now, it can't be used, obviously, for remote commerce, or some call it e-commerce, because in that case, the consumer is, uh, cardholder is keying the card in another keyboard at home. Um, but uh, that is uh, also, as it turns out, not an area at home, if you will, that merchants are required to secure. We're not required to secure the, uh, the end consumer's home PC and keyboard uh, you know, from, from these things. Past, once it's in the browser, needing to be encrypted, of course, et cetera. So even encryption comes in uh, into play in e-commerce. Um, I may belabor this point, um, and I feel like I've been you know, saying it at the top of my lungs, for the last six years, um, um, certainly not as many conferences as CISC has, has spoken at, but probably um, you know ten or so, ten to twelve conferences a year that I speak at. Um, and um, should I, lest I become tired of talking about the differences between EMV, which helps stop counterfeit card, and it not being the answer to stopping breaches and compromises, um, Danielle found an article this weekend uh, that came out, and Dark Reading will not point the author out. Um, you know, really chastising merchants that. Um, one of these major recent breaches that has happened, which I won't talk about them either, but you may may know who they are, uh, national breach um, where you know the merchant really was being negligent because they didn't have EMV and this could have stopped the breach. Really way off point, really way confuses the market that's already been confused. Interesting to note that the gentleman had 25 years of the security experience. So this is something that I do feel the need that I need to continue to bring up when I speak. And please do so yourself that EMV is not the answer to stop a breach, nor is it the answer to stop a compromise. And very many people believe that, and certainly security professionals who have not looked into this or listened to my webinar or CISC. Uh, encryption, all data needs to be encrypted. Certainly EMV chip cards have their place in, in fastly reducing counterfeit card fraud, which is, which is a real problem. It certainly is in certain areas of the world, certainly in certain areas of this country, and within certain verticals does its job like nothing else, it is great at stopping that, but it is not the right tool to stop a data compromise or a data breach. Um, it's the gold standard P2PE is for this, as we mentioned that there are other options for encryption that are not standardized. So um, I would say one of the, one of the what, a lot of folks just say, well, you know, if it's just validated encryption, that just means it's using good cryptography and the encryption is strong enough. But, you know, there's other company over here, you know, they've got a big name and they've got an encryption solution and it's cheaper and, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever they feel it is, or they're being given to it for free because, you know, they, the other company can't sell it, whatever it might be. Folks do oftentimes choose solutions that have not been validated uh, by the council. I can, so what I'm going to do is sit out on these next two slides to give you some of the differences between the validated solutions and the non-validated one. First of all, it's not just validated encryption. It is a solution, and that's why the council calls it a PCI secure, uh, excuse me, um, validated P2PE solution, not just P2PE, you know, uh, hardware or something. And that's a solution because it includes validated hardware, right? So that means the devices have gone through rigorous testing uh, and have their own security requirements for how the firmware should be separated from the application, um, you know, all these different things, how they, the, the tamper resistant modules and, and, and being able to hardware to protect itself. The validated software applications that go into the device itself, obviously not just the hardware should be validated, but also any applications that touch the data in the firmware. And then also those who put these components together from injection to validated hardware to validated software, um, those like the blueprints of the world, and there are there are there are many um, that those that come and do that put all of this together, in, in, including the key management, the decryption environments, the injection of keys, 
puts all the, they also then go through an additional validation to say not only have you used used audited or validated components, but then you're integrating this whole solution together and providing as a surface offering that itself has been uh, properly configured uh, and, and put together. So it is uh, it is interesting. Uh, I like to say you know um, it's it's the only time I, I've seen solutions in any industry where it's an audited solution put together of multiple audit sub audited uh, uh, components. So it is everything here has been double audited, so to speak, which is which is great. Uh, and that's because the value proposition that's being put forward to merchants, they need to be able to really rely on this. So uh, I think the program has been put very together very well, and it's something I know that we're all excited about and have been for some time. Um, so let's talk about some of the key differences. Um, don't want to go too deep here. We can always talk about your specific uh, situations because there there are literally over a thousand different uh, requirements for a validated solution. So there are quite a few differences. Um, but um, here's a couple top end ones. So your key injection facilities, right? When we're talking about these devices, and we talk about the key, the encryption, right? Well, you can have the world's largest, safe, strongest you know, uh, thickest walls and no one can get into it. But if the bad guy has the key because it's laying there and they know the combination, they're just going to open it up. So it doesn't really matter how strong your safe is. kind of matters how strong your key is or how strongly you protect your key. And it's the same goes for encryption. Um, you know, it, it's that key management which becomes ever so important to the solution. When you go with non-validated or non-audited solutions, these key injection facilities can have no protection. Maybe one person can um, can have access to the key. What happens if they accidentally expose it? Well, over on the side of validated, the rooms have to be able to electronically uh, be able to tell whether or not they're all, at all times it has dual control, which means there's two folks in there at all times. And if one leaves within 30 seconds, the system has to alarm and all the keys have to be destroyed and this whole uh, protocol has to go back to back through. So there's a lot of dual controls. The buildings themselves have to go through structural security, physical security inspections and have certain requirements um, that all four, I guess, uh, all six walls uh, in the room uh, are impenetrable, uh, not just like a tall cage with nothing on top or someone can come over the top. You know, it just really gets down into the weeds. But there are significant differences between the injection facilities where these keys are put in. Um, the other thing I think this is a very important one is that this encryption happens immediately in the firmware. If you go and you look at non-certified uh, solutions, a lot of times this happens in the application. So it's swiped into the device, someone's built an application in that device, but that application is sharing RAM with a driver license application or a POS integration application or all sorts of other things that may be getting constant updates right through the web on that device as new patches or new updates or features come out. And those things can expose your encryption application to, uh, to attack. So now the application that's supposed to be encrypting and protecting your whole business itself is being attacked and, um, and RAM is being scraped right out of the device. So that's not allowed with PCI secure certified solutions here. So um, I think it's important difference and, and you will find uh, not to call any of them out. Many solutions out there that are not validated that still operate in this manner. Tamper resistant. This is a really important one. Uh, this means that when you unplug the device from power and you put it in a closet for 10 years and somebody comes and steals it and tries to open up the plastic and put bad hardware or software inside of it, it can tell that's happening because it's got a lifetime battery in there. It, uh, you know, throws its tamper switch, you know, uh, deletes its keys, uh, sort of renders itself useless. So the next time it's plugged in, um, you know, for example, once it's sending something through, we're saying, oh, this device should be quarantined. We need to notify the merchant and the provider that someone tried to hack into it. So this is a holistic, managed uh, process that also includes the devices protecting themselves. None of this is required with non-validated solutions. And it's pretty scary to be to be honest with you because a lot of breaches have happened um, by folks being able to do physical uh, attacks on these devices. The last two are important here, decryption being only done in hardware. So once that gets over to the solution and your P2PE solution provider is decrypting that data for you, they have to use, with P2P PCI's version, they have to use HSMs, or what's called hardware security managers, modules. I mean, these are very expensive, right? Um, you know, uh, sorts of devices that the keys can't come out. They can go in and be decrypted and come out, but the keys can't come out. 
and they have their own special validation by FIPS and by, or by PCI in order to come up to a certain level um, within it, with the NIST program in order to, uh, to, to, to ensure the security of that. Put that against other solutions who do all of this in software in the back offices at your provider and databases. What happens if a database or a software application, you know, administrator doesn't lock the door, uh, leaves the key open, leaves something open, maybe forgets to review the security of their code or puts a wrong line of code or their own PC that they're coding this software in is itself attacked and something snuck in and now it's in the encryption decryption environment and now the whole thing is exposed. There are a lot of different ways that that can go wrong and there are a lot of ways those things have gone wrong in the past for providers. That's why with certified solutions, that's not an option. All that can only happen, all of the key management can only happen inside of these HSMs. So fundamental difference in not only securing, as you can see on the top here, securing merchant side, but also securing the provider side as well. And then finally, with all these devices, thousands of devices and thousands of locations moving around in different statuses, and as we talked about clerks and sandwich artists and all these other folks perhaps touching devices, someone needs to know where all these devices are, who's on first, who's on second, what are the status of the devices, and be able to centrally manage all this kind of stuff. So that's called chain of custody, uh, and, and, it's, and it's strict, and it's something that um, does come along with this. And, um, and, and it is different. Now, you, you really have no confidence over the non-certified, whether or not someone bought that device on eBay. It already had exposed firmware in it by the time it reached your, 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 your uh, restaurant. And you put in a device that somebody bought from somebody, from somebody, right? Maybe it ended up a whole, has its own life cycle that this device has gone through before you ever bought it. And it's already been exposed before you put it. How, how scary is that, right? So this life cycle, this chain of custody is super important so that you know the device you have, you know, has its own sort of car, quote unquote, you know, Carfax, if you will. It's got its own chain of custody. It's been tracking it around. What do you get for this? Big difference, right? First of all, a lot of uh, small merchants uh, and medium merchants want to go, or even large merchants that operate smaller locations, uh, want to go for that short form P to P E S A Q with only 33 questions. Um, that's only valid for certified solutions. Um, so big, very big difference. Um, we'll go through this one really quick, uh, but uh, you know, the, uh, there, what are the major difference, uh, not only from security, but a lot of folks want to reduce uh, the uh, scope, if you will, the number of requirements that might be applicable for their cardholder environments. They may be, maybe, may be wanting to reduce the size of their cardholder environment. For example, we do work with universities and and uh, box offices, and you can imagine at some of these maybe st student, uh, you know, aid or student, um, you know, finance windows, where you go up there and someone's taking a payment, but there's also a POS. And, well, what are we going to do now? This other POS uh, has to be secured, and these PCs over here, or this printer's over there, this Wi-Fi over there. All of a sudden, all these other things are brought into scope because they're sharing the same environment as the credit card machine. Well, with P2PE now, all of a sudden that environment goes down because that environment now is just that device, not all the other devices sitting on the network. So that can vastly, vastly, vastly reduce the size, the number of components that security teams have to figure out how to secure and networks they have to figure out how to segment and secure. So this is a huge, not only sort of uh, size of their network that comes down and what they have to manage from compliance, but then also within the smaller environment, you know, for example, that device, now, instead of 335 requirements, there's only 30 requirements. So they go down by like up to 90%. So it uh, really makes things exponentially smaller uh, and much more manageable and at the same time more secure. Really, the only requirements that are left for merchants um, that, uh, that, that, that may have a device with this, and that's the only way they accept cards, could be, hey, do you store paper data? Okay, well, that might be not applicable if you're not storing a you know, card on paper. And do you manage an up-to-date inventory? And do you have, uh, you know, awareness policies for your employees? So as you can see, even the remaining 33 requirements are all what I might consider soft requirements, right? These aren't uh, having to do with networks and programming and all this stuff because the, all those environments are out of scope because the device is encrypting the data before it, it, it happens. And it, another way to look at it is the data coming out of the device is not pulling everything it touches into scope or into danger, right? Into the danger zone because, hey, if this car data is 
traverses that network or it's on the same network as that PC over there, all of a sudden that PC is in the danger zone and it could provide an attack vector or a way for bad guys to get at the data, et cetera. If we encrypt the data in the device, it then and when it comes out of the device, it doesn't pull all these other resources into scope, which is just the, the, best, the best, best place to be. Um, so really starting to wrap up here. Um, the components, uh, you know, from cost savings, we're seeing reduction in physical security and surveillance, reduction in firewall costs, uh, security information event management systems, the overall reduction in the, in the work effort for systems administration, hiring and training, uh, compliance assessment. This is a big one too. Uh, the, you know, if you're, if your cardholder data environment is that much smaller and there's that much, that much fewer, uh, for you to comply with, your compliance assessment, um, will, be, go faster and become cheaper. Uh, also, another one here, a lot of you know that you have to have uh, approved sc uh, scanning vendors to do vulnerability scans for you quarterly on all the resources that you have that um, that may touch card data. Well, if they're not touching card data because it's P2P encrypted, well, they don't need ASV vulnerability scans. So there's a reduction in cost, cost there. There's also a reduction in uh, the response that your teams have to do to bring all those systems you know, patch them up and, and configure them up to pass the vulnerability scans. So that's a very important one there. And also reduction in penetration testing, which is also a requirement um, that these have ex external and internal penetration scans. Um, CISC had to say that these tasks and documentation are reduced because all the clear text cardholder data is removed from the POS and the network environment. So because all of these, uh, because this data is no longer in the clear and it's all encrypted, all these things are either reduced, and in some cases, the requirements are uh, are removed. EMV, um, you know, we, we do look at the EMV thing as, as, as also good for P2PE because a lot of the merchants out there that upgraded their devices to accept EMV chip cards, lo and behold, those devices are candidates for the P2PE program. They already have um, perhaps the encrypted hardware necessary, and that's good news, but it's also sad news because we've seen some major breaches where we found out um, uh, that uh, uh, one was actually um, quoted in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we'll point to, won't point out who it is, but they had an encryption program, but they just hadn't turned it on yet. So um, be sure you know, that if you have it, please turn it on and hook it up with a solution provider that can do the encryption. GDPR is providing a sort of external pressure coming in from Europe. We're seeing you know, California taking their first sort of step and New York maybe looking at it. So this um, general data protection regulation, I know it doesn't just have to do with payments, but it's raising the stakes by literally raising the effect of a, the stick, if you will. Gosh, with $4 million fines, who can afford for things to go wrong? And on top of everything else that's bad about just exposing the data in the first place, the stick just got a lot higher. So we have the carrot over here of you know compliance and the complexity and the costs all going down, which is a great carrot, but there are some very big sticks out there like GDPR. Uh, that, that can include fines, unless you think, well, you know, it doesn't apply to me because I'm in the U.S. We're seeing a lot of states looking at that, and also many of you have international operations that might be touching, um, you know, EU citizens um, either abroad or as they come over here. And finally, um, we did find out that there is a requirement uh, somewhere in the world. Visa actually requires for all new MPOS that the devices be P2PE validated, uh, the solutions be validated, or be equivalent to that, which um, I can't imagine a solution being equivalent without itself being audited. Uh, but anyways, uh, that is uh, showing that there are places in the world and there are technologies and verticals in the world that are now starting to be mandated. So uh, we're, we're, we're seeing that this is something that is coming and I'm glad that you took some time out of your day to, to, to listen to this. Good news is, is that it's more accessible than ever. One of the early complaints was that there was only one provider, right, in 2014, Bluefin, um, but there's 78 now, so quite a bit of growth. Growth, and every man, every major manufacturer now offers this, so that's good news. So you know, a, there's no excuse to not have it, but b, it's already out there, and and most of the newer devices, I can't, it's hardly any that I can see from the major manufacturers that don't have the capability built in there at a hardware level. Key injection facilities for distribution and logistics worldwide is about two dozen uh, companies that provide that. Many of them have multiple locations. Um, Bluefin Solution, we offer a uh, connection to about half of those. Uh, we have the most uh, devices on um, over 80 different devices um, from all the major manufacturers. Uh, 100 connected partners out there. These include all sorts of payment gateways and payment processors, and we offer it uh, in multiple 
multiple different fashions. If you get a hold of this later, please go to that link in the middle. It will show you all of the validated solutions. Um, our devices across all the major manufacturers, uh, including Verifone and Ingenico, uh, some of the names you can see up here, uh, many across the Ingenico spectrum, PAX, many devices across Verifone and ID Tech. And let me tell you, every quarter, uh, companies like Bluefin are adding devices uh, in order to keep up with the demand and all the different um, all the different ways that merchants want to do this. And key injection facilities, once you get into this, you'll, you'll understand that, hey, if you've got offices in Europe or you've got offices in Canada, uh, might not be appropriate to have your devices injected in Arizona, <laughs> for example. So uh, you, this, we, we have taken this seriously. We have 12 now across the world and are adding others. You'll see this, lo this list being, this list growing. Um, P2P e-manager is something that separates uh, our solution. We did learn early on that uh, it can be uh, a burden for some merchants and other solutions out there to track all these devices or figure out where their devices are, manage their program. We have a system called P2P e-manager, patented with 15 patents, uh, and it's exclusive to us. And um, it manages the entire P2P e program. So if you already have a solution today, um, and you probably feel this pain of having to manage where all your different devices are, um, this is something that we, being first mover, uh, did learn feedback from our merchants and have an exclusive P2PE management platform, which simplifies the management of your worldwide program, or even if it's just, uh, you know, for a single location. Uh, finally here, uh, we talked about 100 different connected partners. Because we were the first out there um, and we saw that this demand was going to be so, so great for this, we did decouple that from our payment processing services. Um, some of you may not know that. Uh, but we did that many years ago, and in fact, you know, our primary um, go-to-market and our primary service that we offer is through our partners. There's over 100 connected now. Verifone's uh, Payment Gateways, USA ePay, as you can see, CyberSource, you know, very large Visa solution. Merchant Link, very, very large in the, um, in the, in the, in the Micros Oracle, uh, POS, Anders, Anderson's Axe in Europe, 3 Delta, BridgePay, uh, Pacquiolan, which operates, oh gosh, it must be nearly 500 box office stadiums, Freesia and Healthcare, Audience View, same with, uh, with, uh, with box offices um, and uh, special event centers and theaters, NCR's Counterpoint plat platform, Blackboard, uh, also Blackbaud, First Atlantic, Com Atlantic Commerce across the Caribbean in Cardinox. You can see, um, and this is just a sampling, but there's over 100. Um, a lot of folks have said, look, instead of building this solution, let's connect to Bluefin for it. Um, and this is also helpful for you if you are an organization like a university, for example, that may be using, uh, might have a cafeteria, may have student, um, you know, uh, admission, you may have, uh, um, you know, may have child care, <laughs> may have uh, donations being accepted from alumni. As you can see, all kinds of different ways payments are coming in, all kinds of different payment uh, POSs and all kinds of different providers needing to use that. But one of the things we always recommend is to have a single payment uh, P2PE security solution so that you don't have 15 different POS providers and have to have 15 different security providers because then you create your own complexity. So uh, certainly something that separates us. But with that, uh, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Danielle because that's, I'm sure we have 10 minutes of questions here. Yes, we do, actually. So thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Rustin and Sisk. I think that was a wonderful overview. And we're going to open it up for questions now. The first one that I see it is somebody actually who downloaded the white paper, Rustin and Sisk, and they wanted to know at the university, can you give a brief overview on exactly what NESA means, uh, the non-encrypted solution assessment? Um, sure. I, I guess maybe I'll give a I'll give a 10 second one, and, and maybe Cisco will have something to add to it. So the non-listed encryption solution assessment, or you know, N NESA, was provided because there were a lot of providers out there that wanted to that had a solution that they were not planning to or could not take through full PCI validation. But they wanted to be able to provide in a, in a very secure man, a very uh, objective manner to a potential buyer, okay, this doesn't do everything it should do, and here are the specific requirements it does not meet, so that that merchant can say, okay, if I choose this solution, it's not going to meet these 10 or 15 requirements, so then it's up to the merchant to go and, 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 and meet those 10 or 15 requirements. So it still doesn't provide access to the P2P ESAQs, uh, it still doesn't provide that full validated benefit, uh, and in many ways, you know, said a different way, what it does is it exposes the deficiencies or the defects 
of that solution in the area specifically where it doesn't meet the standard. For that reason, a lot of providers haven't gone through it. They might do it for a single merchant who is attached to them and, and can't, for some reason, change at all because of you know legacy integrations or whatever it might be. So they want to have an objective outside opinion of here's the here's what it doesn't meet. Now the merchants themselves or the business has to go meet those requirements. And Sis, would you add anything to that? Yes, uh, I think also what we can mention is that I mean, we know that the, the BSA Security Standards Council, they published uh, the document, I think it was in November 2016, as part of the B2B program documentation. Um, and to help with the understanding of what it's all about, they've also published the Frequently Asked Questions document that you can download. And uh, on page six of the white paper, we've actually provided the link to the, to the Frequently Asked Questions document, as well as that, uh, that document that the council published in November 2016. So you're welcome to look at that on, on page six of the white paper. It will explain a whole lot about uh, NESA itself. Excellent, thank you so much. I think that was a great response and that's a great overview. And again, folks, um, you know, we have more information within the white paper. I have another question, Rustin. This one actually is from a retailer asking basically, um, they had done an implementation about two years ago for Verifone devices in terms of uh, doing the new stores based, uh, the new devices rather based on EMV, how would they get P2PE today with those devices that are already in their stores? Okay, so the good news is is we have uh, many merchants who who, uh, who are in the same situation, or which is a good one, good situation to be in because they purchase devices that have um, the hardware already built in, in there to be able to do that. Um, it would be need to be something that we have a conversation with a solution engineer. I'm happy to be involved with that as well because there's gonna be specifics, right? Which uh, version of um, of XPI do you have? Um, you know, uh, where did you buy the devices? What's been the life cycle of the devices? Uh, when did you buy them? It sounds like they're pretty recent. Um, so when some of these questions are answered, then we formulate a plan. The good news is, is also at the PCI FAQ, as just to point out, they do have a section on on you on um, how to put a validated solution in previously deployed or as you might call fielded devices. So there's certainly a path for that, and we've taken the extra step of working with Verifone uh, and getting in in in, in the listing against their Verifone R RKI or VRK, what, what they call which is remote key uh, injection. So we can do some of this with in, in conjunction with Verifone to remotely inject keys to these fielded devices in the past. Uh, and certainly some merchants still do this. They route in sort of a round robin fashion those devices in from the field and as they put new ones out into those locations. Um, but also remote key injection is, is possible now and we're doing that very large scale. So my suggestion is because there, there could be, uh, you know, we need to have a solution engineer to know the specifics, but absolutely it can be done and has been done um, uh, on very large scales um, for the last couple of years. One last point is that the remote key injection really wasn't a possibility until P2PE 2.0. So when you're looking at solutions on the P2PE list out there, if this is important to you, please choose one, uh, like Bluefin, that does have the P2PE 2.0 designation so that they can take part in the remote key injection uh, of fielded devices. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So I've got an interesting one that actually takes us a little bit outside of payment security, Rustin. I have somebody specifically asking, you know, with all of the IoT devices coming on, and I think, you know, probably a good example might be healthcare, uh, is there a future for uh, PCI validated point to point encryption solutions to encrypt other data? Well, I, I think the IoT presents, uh, you know, I know this isn't the question, but, you know, look look around your home, look around your office, look around the fact of how many of your employees bring in IoT devices, you know, watches and phones and tablets and, 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 and you know, heartbeat monitors, who knows what, right? All these different things into work uh, with them. And these now, when exposed, can provide other attack surfaces, if you will, or ways for bad guys to get in and, and then attack your uh, attack your network. So I think IoT um, certainly is, some, is, is another reason why point-to-point -point encryption is so important because the bad guys have so many different ways now to get in through uh, these devices who folks don't think of as a security concern. You know, it's just my watch. 
Um, but uh, to go answer the question more directly, right now, um, point-to-point encryption is focused on the payment security. I believe that the concepts of it are very uh, germane and applicable outside of the payment space. One of the things that Bluefin ha has done is with our decryption environment, you know, we can decrypt things like social security number and driver license number and certain policy number and other things that you might have. Uh, we can we can take those in and certainly provide that level of encryption for those other sensitive data. But I think uh, that's an area and that you'll see innovation happening. I think right now everyone's focused on let's fix the 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 biggest problem right now, at least for merchants. Um, you know, is, is the is the payment side. I, I would say next would be healthcare, as was pointed out, and then on to you know other PII. Excellent. And so I think we have time for one more question, and this is specifically, Rustin, about handling of cardholder data. And I think this person is actually asking probably uh, about the handling in two different scenarios. So the question is, can you touch on how the cardholder data is handled after going to Bluefin's gateway? That's question number one. Um, and question number two, Bluefin has the only key, key to decrypt the data, and then how does it get to the processor? e.g. Heartland First Data, et cetera. So I think it's probably a dual question of, A, how does that happen within Bluefin if they use our gateway? And B, how does that happen if we are running the transaction through our decryptics partner? Yeah, and this is, a, this is a good question. So I'm going to go back to that slide when I said we had 100 connected partners. And I want to be clear because the question may have a built-in assumption, which, uh, which I'd like to, 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 to clarify. And that assumption is, is that every one of these transactions has to go through a, a gateway that Bluefin owns. And that is actually not true, and is actually something that separates Bluefin from uh, pretty much every solution out there, and is something that we helped create along with the PCI Council. Um, and it's now um, called sublisting, but we also have taken part in P2P 2.0's uh, componentization, or what they call um, decryption components. And a lot of words there, but the point being, um, for for the for what we've been discussing today with these 100 connected partners, those devices don't go to Bluefin directly, right? Those devices have our keys in them, and they're encrypted in that device. But then that transaction goes off to, for example, CyberSource or Verifone or NCR's their payment gateway. Then what they behind do behind the scenes is they hit our decryption service that we host, and we give them the decrypted data back. And then they process it on from their gateway to the processor, and they have the football, if you will, from there. So as you can see, with these hundred connected partners, which is our go-to-market here, these are not um, we, we are not uh, we are not the payment gateway. We are not the payment processor. And so this is a very unique application, which not only allows um, you know many many more folks and businesses to be able to get access to this technology to perhaps their current providers or come along and pick one of the 100 connected payment gateway and payment processor partners to be able to get access to this. So it gives them a lot more flexibility. A, B, as I mentioned, some of them may be required to have multiple payment gateways. For example, if they have food service in the sky for an airplane, but on the ground they've got an over-the-counter, you know, for doing ticketing. Two wildly different systems with different point of sales and different payment gateways, but they don't want to have two different security providers. Well, they can have one Bluefin provider because all we're doing is the decryption component. And that's one of the brilliant things about what the council did with P2P 2.0 was allow companies like Bluefin to just provide the P2P service and not have to make someone change their payment gateway or change their payment processor in order to get access to this important technology. Excellent. And for this specific individual, Jeff, I will actually send you a slide after this that shows uh, what Rustin is talking about because you have that specific question on keys, and it'll show you a diagram basically on how the decryption is done. One thing I wanted to mention, Rustin, in terms of what you just spoke about is, you know, I know we're uh, at 201 now, but can you touch on basically not only does this work with partners, but this actually can work for uh, direct to a large merchant as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so what we see, um, some large merchants, in effect, operate their own switch. They might call it or operate their own payment gateway, might do their own payment processing, or not payment processing, but payment gateway services. And that's because they may have thousands of locations. And at a certain point, you know, they, they, they don't seek to have external payment gateway partners and they want to deal with direct with the processors. And certainly some of them might be perhaps connected directly to Visa and MasterCard, right, and being going around the authorization networks. Who knows? 
Point being that some of these merchants do connect to us uh, because in many ways they're act acting as their own clearinghouse for transactions. So, so certainly um, we can work directly with these uh, large uh, do-it-yourself uh, merchant applications. What PCI calls those is MMS, Merchant Managed Solutions. Those are not listed on the council website because they're not supposed to be sold uh, to other folks, right? But they can be certainly audited uh, and, um, and, and, and the, being able to, for them to be able to get to that kind of solution, audit solution, can, can avail themselves of component providers um, like Bluefin that are out there. So what you do to find those comp component providers is go to the list that you saw in the link in the page that was a few pages back at the PCI website. And then up in the top, you'll see a list for component providers and then all the different components, decryption, encryption, key injection facilities will be listed there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rustin. Thank you, thank you Jessica, for uh, your wonderful commentary today. And everybody on this call, thank you so much for joining us. A couple of things that you're going to receive from me in the next few days. Um, number one, if you haven't downloaded the white paper webinar, we encourage you to do so. I will send you a link on how to do that. Number two, we will be posting this webinar on demand on our website. Uh, probably tomorrow you will all get a link for that as well. Number three, I'll send you some FAQs that may be helpful uh, in, in considering PCI validated point-to-point -point encryption, encryption solutions. And last but not least, if you would like a copy of this deck, please reach out to me directly. Otherwise, we are not going to be making it public and posting it on the website. So thank you again, Sisk and Rustin, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you for joining. And have a great rest of the day.